Hello and welcome to chapter six, securing a local area network. So um, let's get started because this is going to be a long um, lecture. It's gonna go through all the different types of attacks at, a, at the local area network and how to mitigate against all of these different attacks. Believe it or not, most of the attacks occur inside the network and more than the outside because there's a lot of trusted a lot of employees or disgruntled employees might uh, compromise your network so when it comes to the perimeter of the network you can set up a vpn you can set up firewalls and ips's like we've discussed earlier and you can prevent a lot of the attacks from the outside but internally you can uh, you know inside your LAN. You can have many different types of attacks that compromise your network as well. You know, um, you probably want to set up an ESWA because you have a web server. We'll talk about all of these in your um, DMZ zone. You have your web server, your email server, your DNS, and all of that. They also need to be protected. Your DHCP server also need to be protected as well. So not only your um, not only you need to protect your network from the outside, but also you need to protect it from the inside as well. And we're going to talk about all the different types of attacks that can occur from inside your network and how to really mitigate against all of these different types of attack. So you can have a good solid LAN that is well secured and everyone has access to all their resources whenever they need to. All right, so the traditional endpoint security, typically what you do is you always have an antivirus program installed on your on your local hosts to make sure that it can protect all the from all the different types of ant, you know, malwares that are out there. Um, a host based firewall is to make sure that uh, the host can only have, you know, can protect or filter packets locally. Um, not only on the perimeter of the network, not having only firewall on the edge of your network, but you also a software based firewall on your computer. You can prevent many different attacks like from ping, to, ping of death attack. Does somebody keep pinging you, for example? Host based IPS2, you can have that another software on your computer that will detect and prevent uh, specific attacks on a host. All right, and also the borderless network. Now the problem is you may have a whole bunch of different devices, you know, bring your own devices, the BOYD. You have Android devices, uh, Mac, uh, laptops, uh, iPads coming into the networks, and then you got to think about how do we protect all of these different devices when they need access to the internal network. You know, securing the endpoints in a borderless network could be a challenge because, you know, uh, you need to know all the different types of operating systems that are running and what are the security loopholes that there might be in there. So you, uh, after an attack, you may ask, you know, some of these questions. Where did it come from? What was the threat method at the endpoint? So you had to do a lot of learning and, uh, a lot you have to be real educated on how the system operates and the different types of attacks that are being used all right so you may want to think about getting on the host regardless of what type of host you have antivirus software spam filtering url filtering for specific websites blacklisting all the different types of attacks that were blacklisted and data loss prevention software so you may think about installing all of these different types of software on those host devices in a borderless network before you let them join in the network okay so that's the first thing i want you to write down the host based protection software that you want to add to devices that are going to be added in the borderless network all right let's move on now, some solutions that Cisco offers are the um, the AMP, the ESA, the WSA, and the NAC. So we'll take a look at each one of those um, separately. Oops. Actually, let's go and actually look at those. 
when it comes I took some notes in here so you can take a look at where are we with the um, there you go Cisco can give you here's what you need let me write these down when it comes to the amp that's the um, the anti malware protection that Cisco has actually they bought them out from another company so I want you to write down that AMP can give you file reputation, analyzes the files in lines and block them or applies the policies, file sandboxing and file uh, retro retrospection. So you want to write those down. So this is a software that Cisco can um, install on your, on your devices. They also have the ESA appliance the um the email security for all of your emails web security appliances also and the network admission control and uh we'll talk and you know all of these notes that we'll talk about that in class when we go over it a little bit for for example the esa uh fights spam viruses blended you know and all different types of threats that are out there. Uh, the WSA uh, for the web security appliance, it provides a complete control of how users access the internet, you know, what websites, what applications, what can be blocked, uh, messaging, video, audio, all of that can be controlled. Um, using the, the network admission control, we can allow, you know, the NAC is only used really to authorize any device that has been compliant so you look at devices and make sure that they are being compliant with the security policy of the organization and if they are then you allow them to be authorized and have access if you are if your computer is not set up with the security features that it's supposed to have then you're not even going to let them access in other words if you bring in a laptop from outside and it doesn't have any security access on it no anti-virus software you're not going to allow them to have access even though they may have um even though they may have you know the right credentials to be authenticated but if their system is not set up and not secured you're not going to allow them to have that that's what the NAC is for all right, so do me a favor, write these right down here for uh, not only the AMP, but the ESA, the WSA, and the purpose of having an ACK. All right, when you're done with that, let's go back to our um, slides and continue with them. Uh, when it comes to the hardware, and software encryption of your local machine. Um, Mac software allows that and um, BitLocker for the Windows and there's a whole bunch of others like TrueLock and a whole bunch of other software that you can install on your local machine and encrypt, completely encrypt the hard drive. You can encrypt specific files also on your, um, on your machine using the EFS system, but you can encrypt the whole hardware the whole hard drive all right so here's the amp the advanced malware protections we talked about that because it can protect against before during and after um, you can have up to 101.6 million security devices 150 endpoints are being um that's where they gather all that information from. So a lot of information is in real time is being threatened. A hundred terabytes of security intelligence are are analyzed daily. Thirteen billion web pages. So AMP can do a lot to really find out all the different types of vulnerabilities that are out there. All right. So you can have AMP for you know endpoints networks or even content security if you want to but mostly it's used for endpoints you know on your workstations if you need them to be installed when it comes to email and web security you can use the ews and um, global threats spam blocking you can do advanced malware protections all the different encrypt your email messages for example when they're going out 
so we can take care of all of that for you. So you can have the WSA taken care of if you need to go to a website, for example, the inf before you, the firewall, the ASA firewall will send the information to the WSA and for verification. And then the WSA will tell the firewall, all right, let them through. Anything that comes from outside, the firewall will always send that information to the WSA before it sends it to the actual website. So the WSA will be the guy that everybody has to go to for security check, right? Depending on all the packets, because the firewall cannot do any of that. So that's probably a good appliance to have, okay? And also you can have that for your email as well, checking your emails. Your emails always will go to the ESA before your email goes out and any of the email that comes in has to go through the ESA as well. All right, the NAC. The NAC is really an appliance like I said earlier. Um, all the devices coming into the network have to have security um, set up on them. For example, you may, if you bring in your laptop, it has to have a minimum of uh, antivirus software. It has to have, it has to be set up for, um, it has to have a firewall that's active, for example. And if it doesn't, the NAC will not allow you to be authenticated. Simple as that. Uh, so here are the different enforcements. You can, you can enforce it, you know, the switch has to have a certain setup. The ports may need to be protected, for example, or secured. The firewall has to have, has, for example, to be active on a specific interface. A specific um, access list has to be applied on the gigabit zero zero in the following directions, for example. All right, so the NAC will double check, make sure that all of these appliances adhere to specific policies and all these securities are active on those devices. If not, they will disable the connection. All right, so um, you can have network access for guests if you want to. You know, you can, the NAC will allow that. So you can set that very easily with the NAC. The NAC profiler also can be used to each device will have a specific profile. For example, if you are an iPhone or a TV, the, the, the NAC profiler will say, if you are a TV, here's the following security that should be set up on it. So any of that, anybody that's trying to access it will go to the profile, double check, make sure that it is okay and it will be activated. All right. Now we can get into the layer two security. So the whole different types of attacks that occur uh, inside the LAN itself uh, and the different types of vulnerabilities that are out there and how we can mitigate against them. Uh, when it comes to security, security is really, it all depends on your weakest link and your weakest links is the data, data link, layer because a few data link layer has been compromised everything is compromised from layer three to the top so you can have if you can access layer two data because everything is encapsulated in a frame then you have access to all the data the applications the ports the ip addresses everything so that's uh, so you really need to protect the data link you have the CAM table, the MAC address table attacks. You have the VLAN attacks, the DHCP, the ARP attacks, the ARP spoofing attacks, which we'll talk about, and the STP attacks. We're going to take each one of those, discuss what each attack is and how to prevent it. So all of these six different attacks can occur, but they are preventable with the right setup of security measures that we're gonna take care of. So some of them might be configuration that we need to do to make sure to avoid all of these different attacks. Uh, so let's take a look at the MAC address table. Um, when it comes to the MAC address table, first you need to understand how a switch operates, how it learns the MAC addresses and how it populates the MAC address table inside the switch. What the switch does, is every time a packet comes into 
a frame comes into the switch, the very first thing that the switch does is it looks at the source MAC address of the incoming frame and which port it came from. And because it knows which port it came from and looking at the source MAC address, then it knows that specific MAC address resides at that specific port. So for example, the MAC address 00197172 E0 is located at 0.4 because this device with this MAC address, the 22 E0, well, had stamped this MAC address as the source on his frame when he sent a frame to the switch and the switch looked at the source MAC address and had this source MAC address and because it was coming from port 04 it knew that this device was located at port 4. That's why it placed it in here. The word dynamic means the switch learned it dynamically and this will age by the way. You could put a specific time which we'll talk about that maybe for 10 minutes and you can take them out. So that's how the switch populates the MAC address table by learning the incoming by lear, by inspecting the source mac address of an incoming frame and knowing which port it came from now after that it looks at the destination mac address and looks up the chart to see it looks up the mac address table to see where it will send it to now if it finds it if it finds it on the chart the destination mac address it will send it only to that port now if an incoming frame the destination mac address of an incoming frame is not on the mac address table and then what the switch does is it will send it to everybody now knowing that's called flooding knowing that you could have major problems of course all right so this is going to example examples of how the switch actually works. So what you could do is here's a typical camp table attack, the MAC address attack. An attacker, what they could do is they can, here I'll go back. What he could do, he can use the MAC off software, which is really a command that can just keep sending bogus MAC addresses and fill the switch with bogus MAC addresses. Now, when they are filled with MAC, bogus MAC addresses, when, when a server wants to respond to anybody, the destination, and it's, you know, the destination is not on the list, he will send it to everybody. So the, the, this guy now will learn all the MAC addresses of everybody because he'll be able to send, because when they need to communicate with anybody, because it's the switch MAC address table is flooded with bogus addresses and the destination is not there obviously what the switch does then it will send that information to all the other ports and then the attacker will start capturing the mac addresses of everybody on the network and he can use them to spoof to pretend to be someone else to pretend to be the server we'll talk about spoofing later on all right so we got to prevent that we got to make sure that nobody can just send bogus ip addresses to the switch because the switch has a limit memory once that limit the mac address table limit is filled then it stops filling up and then uh, then you're in trouble of course <laughs> all right so he keeps flooding now the switch floods the frames back and he starts learning all the different types of mac addresses of all the devices on the network here's the command by the way Mac off minus I eth Ethernet or the on the interface and it will start flooding bogus MAC addresses. So how do you mitigate against that? Well, you said port security. I think we've done that a while back. So you go to the interface and you say switch port security that will enable port security. But before you do that, you got to make sure that your fast ethernet zero one in this case is an access port not in dynamic get it so you got to take it out of dynamic see when you get this command you won't be able to do that you have to switch port mode access make the port a data port and then you can enable port security if you enable port security and here is you know the violation is automatically a shutdown uh, the agent is absolute it can stay there for whenever it needs to um only one mac address can be in there the maximum mac address is one 
Okay. All right. So that's what you want to do. Um, uh, a couple of things. Um, the sticky command, if you remember, let's say you wrote switch port mode, uh, switch port security maximum one or two. If you wrote two, that means two different devices can be learned on one port because those two devices might be attached to a hub. Uh, switch port security, MAC address, or VLAN for VLAN voice, which we did that already. You can write the specific MAC address, usually a type MAC address sticky. That means the first person that sends the information, I'll learn his MAC address and I'll make it part of the uh, running configuration file. And if it's saved, it becomes permanent and a static address. All right, and then you want to write down switch port, port security, violation, and you can choose one of those three, either protect, restrict, or shut down. The default is shut down, and I think you should always stick with shut down. What protect does is it will, if it if it in, uh, if it encounters um, an intruder, what it's going to do is it will block them and just leave the port open and doesn't do anything else but that. If it restricts. If you choose restrict, that means it will block an intruder, but it will also log that in, that that happened, write it down, but leave the port open. Shut down what it does, it will close the port completely, and then you have to go back and re-enable the port if it's been shut down because of security breach. And to, be, to do that, you have to go to the interface, shut it down again, administratively by typing the command shutdown and then re-enable it by typing no shut. So the best security measure to a port if there's a violation is to shut it down by typing the command switch port port dash security violation shutdown. Although those those are the three others. So that's the other thing that I want you to write down the port security violation three modes. Protect, restrict, and shut down, and explain what each one is. All right, moving on. You can set down the aging on the port as well. You know, how long can it stay in the MAC address stable? Um, so you can set, typically you can set it for 10 minutes if you want. So if you write switch port, port security aging, you can write it static. That means uh, it will stay there forever. It doesn't change. It cannot be removed. But if you write, you don't write the word static and you leave it dynamic. Um, so, so you can write, you, for example, you can write aging and then you write um, time and then you write 10 for 10 minutes. So for 10 minutes, your IP, your MAC address is going to be erased, and you probably want to do that, is be, because um, this way, if somebody floods your MAC addresses, it can be erased within 10 minutes, and you switches back to normal. If you write inactivity, if there's nothing going, if no data is coming in and out, you probably want to shut down, uh, take them out anyway. So, for a certain amount of time, if you're um, if there's no activity within 10 minutes, then you're out. Excuse me. So you can say switch port for security aging time 10 minutes and type inactivity. You can write that down too. All right. So here's a typical IP fee, uh, IP phones set up. So if you have an iPhone connected to zero one, this is the security commands that you need to do. All right, so you can set up three different devices into the port, maximum of three different devices, the violation shutdown, aging time, 120 minutes in this case. All right, SNMP MAC address notification. You want, if there is any violation to you know, send traps to the SNMP, SNMP traps can be sent to the manager. Uh, with the new addresses that appear on the old ones, so it can give you all the information that's all in the MAC address table. You know, the SNMP traps can be sent by the from the switch to 
the uh, SNMP manager this year that can evaluate the MAC address table to see if there's, you know, been an attack maybe or uh, or somebody uh, been spoofing the MAC addresses or any information that you can analyze using the SNMP. But you have to set up the switch to be able to send traps to the um, to the manager. Okay, let's take a look at some VLAN attacks. Well, when you're having VLANs, what you could do is, since the ports on the switch are set up in dynamic mo mode by default, using the DTP, the dynamic trunking protocol, a PC can come in, set himself to this port, and if he sets himself as a trunk, this automatically become a trunk. And if this is a trunk, anybody that's sending information to the switch also gets sent to the trunk. So now this guy can go to anybody, right? They can hop into any ports because he has information of all the trunks that he wants. He can tap himself into VLAN 10 and then information goes on the, you know, tag himself to VLAN 10, travels on the trunk, ding, ding, and he can get to VLAN 10 or he can get to VLAN 20 whenever he wants to. Why? Because the port was set up as dynamic and he was able to create a trunk right here. We don't want this trunk at all. So we want to disable the DTP from here, right? You could do double tagging too, by the way. So for example, um, you can put, instead of one tag, you can put two tags. So when the switch comes in, it says, oh, VLAN 10, you need to go to VLAN 10, he removes it. You can go to VLAN 10, but also you'll be traveling with still VLAN 20 tag that hasn't been removed yet. So you can get to VLAN 20 as well. So we want to avoid that as a problem too. All right. Uh, so to mitigate against VLAN hopping, make sure that the native VLAN 10, uh, native VLAN is not always a VLAN that's been, you know, the native VLAN is the one that receives untagged frames so uh, if there's any untagged frames you want to put them in a different VLAN so therefore this way we'll make sure that you know and and disable also the DTP okay make sure that the ports are sometimes what you do even though that you are on different VLANs you want to make sure some ports are not going to receive information from anybody from any other VLAN. This is to protect against also the double tagging. So we don't want, you can say, all right, I don't want get any information from this guy no matter what. Or so this will be a protected mode. I'm only want to receive information from this server and nobody else. So if I receive information from here, no good, right? So all the ports are unprotected by defaults. When you protect them, that means you can specifically communicate with the ports that are allowed to communicate with you. All right. So this is, shows you the protected ports, which ones you are allowed to communicate with. So for example, this guy, the switch port is enabled and the negotiate, the twinking, that's the DTP, that means it's enabled right unprotected ports right so did you want it to be protected or not it all depends all right private vlans that means you have your own private lan and you do not want to communicate with anyone else that's what the private vlans are so you can set it up with the there's promiscuous modes community ports that you can have community ports allow you to communicate with your own community uh, these ports have to be promiscuous, which means it will allow, it can take data from anybody and send data to everybody else, right? If you are in a community port, that means you can communicate with the community itself. If you are in your own private LAN, isolated ports, that means only in your VLANs. You know, some ports can only communicate with specific devices, not everybody. Okay, let's go to DHCP spoofing attack. Now, when it comes to the DHCP server, uh, 
you want to because you could either be a bogus DHCP server or somebody can actually get in there and hijack and the uh, the um, the DHCP and put bogus IP addresses in there right but we want to make sure the DHCP spoofing attack is prevented in this case somebody pretending to be a DHCP server right so when an attacker initiate a starvation attack what that does what that means is somebody will send in information in and keep requesting IP addresses from the DHCP server and it will take all the IP addresses from the pool and then what happens is there's no more IP addresses anybody that comes in that wants an IP address won't be able to get one so what do you do as an attacker after you eat up all the MAC addresses from the pool you create your own pool and say hey I'm I have some IP addresses then the other guys will go to the other rogue DHCP server and start grabbing IP addresses from that um, malicious DHCP server and of course it's going to give you IP addresses in a default gateway and you'll be sent somewhere where you're not supposed to be sent right so we want to make sure so that's what they first do is they starve the DHCP server from IP addresses and then they set up a rogue DHCP server so they can offer bogus IP addresses All right, so you have to set up DHCP snooping for that. So please, um, the snooping, the VLAN, <coughs> I want you to write this down. Unauthorized DHCP server messages, you have to set up, you have to set up the ports are either trusted or untrusted. <coughs> to be trusted, that means, that means ports that are as a DHCP server should be trusted. So um, DHCP messages can will be allowed to go through the ports. If you are untrusted, DHCP messages should not be able to go through the ports because you are not a DHCP server. So if this guy's trying to set up a DHCP server, it's not going to work because the port is not going to allow the messages to go through to be protected. To, pre to pretend as a DHCP port. All right, so all clients, ports should be on trusted ports. The trunks should be trusted ports. And I want you to write these commands down on how to set up a trusted and an untrusted ports on a switch to uh, prevent DHCP snooping. So you write the command DHCP snooping you enable it, you go to the interface fast Ethernet 0 and you say DHCP trust. You go to fast Ethernet 05 and you say um, untrust. You can actually write that down too. But in this case, we're going to write IP DHCP limit 6. So you can write down the MAC of addresses that can be allowed to go through here. And then snooping for VLAN 10. 5, 10, 50, and 52. Okay. You can use the command show IP DHCP snooping to verify the DHCP snooping is enabled. All right. Now let's take a look at some ARP attacks. Now, what's, what does ARP does? ARP is when I send out an ARP request, I have the IP address of the destination that I'm trying to reach, but I'm requesting the MAC address of the device that I want to send the packet to. And I need that MAC address to stamp it on the frame. So when I send out that ARP request, everybody that is attached to the switch will hear that broadcast. Now, when this, let's say I want the MAC address of the router because I want to go out, or PCA. So he sent out an ARP request to the default gateway. I hear it. I can get his MAC address. When the router sends out information for his, his MAC address for back to A, I'm the attacker. When I see him asking for a MAC address, I'll say, hey, poof, I'll just go immediately and say, hey, I'm the default gateway. Here's my MAC address before this guy gets to him. So now PCA thinks it's me and um, he'll send information to me, all that information that is going out to the internet. 
that's dangerous right so we got to prevent that we use the deer we're going to use also the DACP snooping and dynamic ARP inspection to prevent that the dynamic ARP inspection what it does we're going to set these as untrusted ports and this is the only guy who's going to be trusted so when PCA asks for the MAC address and this guy sends it the messages will be enabled to go through if he tried to send it it's going to be blocked because the port is set up as untrusted all right so i want you to write that down here's how you set up the arp inspection okay so write that down on how to make these two ports um untrusted ports using the dhcp snooping and then do the inspection on 0 24 make sure that it's been trusted and the other two if you did not do them that means they are untrusted and they will not be allowed to reply with ARP requests if it was for a DHCP. All right. Uh, here's another example using the source destination and the IP address. IP inspections you can validate. You can use validate the MAC address, the destination, and the IP address when you're doing the request. So that's another thing that I want you to write down. You can actually validate the re who is sending it, who is, where is it going to, and the IP address, not just anybody, right? Because the, the attacker can be, is going to be using his source MAC address. And if it's not validated, it's going to be dropped, right? And you can do that at the global method, at the global configuration mode. All right. Now, address spoofing is somebody you uh, you know you may want to use someone else's MAC address to pretend to be someone else. So, um, and you can put that in the MAC address table. So, again, you want to use the IP source guard. So, if you change you know your source MAC address to something else, then the MAC address table is going to think it's you. So, uh, you want to make sure that we can filter the source IP and the source IP and the MAC address filtering. So this is how you can configure the IP source guard. Go to the interfaces 01 and 02 and verify the source. Double check, make sure the source IP is in there. All right, so this is the command. I want you to write that down. How do you verify that the source IP addresses are coming? excuse me, by, by doing this command. IP verify source, very simple. All right, now let's talk about the spanning tree, STP. Um, I think we've covered it in a different course, I think in 207 if I'm not mistaken, but let's briefly go over what the STP is and the different types of problems that STP can have. All right, so uh, the spanning tree protocol is really designed to allow you to have redundancy in your network. So in this case, uh, uh, you can have a redundant switch and a redundant link. So, if, And this, uh, this link will be blocking data from going through. So this actual switch will never have anything to do with it. It'll just be sitting idle. Data from PC1, PC2, and PC3 We'll, go, we'll be able to communicate with PC4 using this trunk. If this trunk fails, then this trunk is automatically by default enabled and then data is rerouted so you can have complete connections without any problems whatsoever. Okay, so that is typically what STP is really designed for is they pick one link and the other links will be sitting idle. The way to do that is what you need to do is the switches are going to talk to each other first and they're going to say we're going to pick one of us as the root bridge. Bridge means a switch. Depending on the lowest MAC address, if you don't do anything or you can set it up yourself by setting a priority, giving a priority to the switch and when the switch talk to each other, the guy with the lowest priority 
the switch with the lowest priority will be elected as the root bridge. Once he's elected as a root bridge, because he has the lowest priority, then he goes to his ports and he makes them designated. Designated ports means data can go in and out of the, those ports without any problems. The other switch is what they need to do. First, they have to pick a port that is closest, closest mean the one with the fastest way to get to the root bridge and make that a root port. The other ports they have to decide is, is data allowed to go in or not? If data is not allowed to go in, for example, like this guy, we'll make it an alternate port or a non-designated port. So these two ports are have to be root ports because they need to send data to it. This is gonna be designated. This is non-designated or an alternate port. Why did he choose to be? Designated, well, these two guys will talk to each other and will say, who has the lowest MAC address? Switch two says, I did. So I'm gonna make my port designated and then you have to make your port non-designated, which really makes this link uh, inactive. So data will have to go through here. Once this link breaks, STP will recognize that and will open up and make this designated port and then data will have to go through here. And this will automatically be the root port, okay? So this is the basic terminology of how it works. Okay, so here's your bridge uh, priority bridge idea. See the priority has the lowest. So this that's why this guy was elected as the root bridge. Uh, the path cost, depending on the link, you know, depending on how fast the link is, that's how we pick up um, which link is which port is going to be the root port so if this is path one path two if each one of those is 100 megabit links so 100 meg is given the cost 19. so this way to get to the root bridge is only going to cost me 19. if i choose port two it's going to cost me 38. that's why i pick port one because it has a lower cost all right, we don't have to get through that. So what they do is they send a bridge protocol data unit. That's when they start sending data to elect talking, you know, bridges talk to each other by sending BPDUs to each other to elect a root bridge. And then they look at the priority to see who has the lowest priority. Um, who, uh, the, who has the lowest priority so we can elect a specific root bridge. And uh, once a root bridge is elected, then they start, you know, who's going to be a root designated or, or an alternate port. All right, now, once these are elected root bridges, are designated and alternate ports, the other ports that are going to be attached to hosts, they should never be root, they're not trunks, right? They should never be designated as root ports or, desi uh, or, root, uh, or designated ports. You have to put port fast on them, which means there will never be trunks. And BPDU guards, that means these guys will never send information, try to uh, join in the elections because he wants to be pretending to be a switch, right? He may send information to say, hey, I'm a switch. Uh, I have a low priority, make me the root port. So if he is a root switch, all the switches will start sending information to him. We don't want, this is a PC. So this port should never be able to uh, join in the election. Only trunk ports will join in the, will allow to send information about uh, switch elections. Okay, so in other words, uh, ports that are attached to workstations should be set up as port fast, which means as soon as you connect them, immediately the port is going to come up for data. It's going to turn green. It will not turn amber. If you notice that when we connect to in the labs, when we connect a device to one of these ports, it, it goes amber and the orange color for about, you know, sometimes close to... 50 seconds, but make it port fast. You're skipping the um, the learning stage and the um, the learning stage, the blocking stage. Immediately go to forwarding, 
you know, you go blocking, learning, listening, you're skipping the learning and the listening, which takes about 40 seconds or so. BPP, uh, BPDU guard is will, will not allow the port to participate in the elections of um, a root bridge. Okay, so if this guy, like I said earlier, he wants to be pretending to be a root bridge, uh, a root bridge, so he can start sending information. Hey, I have the lowest priority uh, bridge ID. So these guys will say, okay, we're going to make you as the root bridge. By the way, what that means, if he's a root bridge, data has to go to him before it goes to any other switch. Okay, that's how STP works, by the way. They elect a root bridge for the reason that, okay, we always go to the root bridge, and from there we can go to your destination. You don't just pick any um, any path to go to your destination. You have to go to the root. That's why we have to elect a root bridge first. And you can have a backup one, too. So if he pretends to be the root bridge, then all the data has to go to him before it goes anywhere else. So... The attacker can then can see all the data. That's probably, not probably, that's definitely what we do not want to do, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to set up PPDU guard on these ports and not allow them to communicate. Port fast also has to be set on there. And we'll talk about these different types of the loop guard and the PP guard and all of that. Um, in fact, uh, we can go directly to my notes. I brought some notes in here that will um, help us. Here you go. So I want you to write all of these down. Port fast. That will bring uh, immediate. This is for the STP, different types of STP attacks that might happen. So port fast will immediately bring an interface configured as an access port. So it doesn't have to go through the listening and the learning state. And the way to do that is you go to the config mode and you type spanning tree port fast default. That will immediately make all the ports as um, port fast. And then anyone specifically that you want to be a trunk, then you, then you say no spanning tree port fast on that port. Okay, to make it a trunk. PPDU guard, that would immediately disable uh, the port from sending out PPDUs. So the way to do that is you're going to write down spanning tree port fast PPDU guard default. Again, you have to be port fast first. So you'll prevent PPD uh, frames from going in and out of that port for the election of the um, this uh, for the election of the root bridge. Okay, and here's the root guard you can never be a root bridge if you are um, prevents the inappropriate switch from becoming a root bridge so you can say span tree root port and loop guard to prevent the alternate or uh, root ports from becoming designated ports so in case a link breaks he immediately makes himself a designated port if you open up if you open up ports immediately to be designated and no alternates then packet starts going all over the place right please write all of these names we'll go back to the slides and um and discuss those in a little bit more detail all right so going back <clears throat> so port fast will make sure that these guys are automatically turned on uh when the when you are plugged in and again, they are going to skip the the listening and the learning state. So when you plug in something into the machine, they immediately go on, go green. They go into the forwarding state. PPUD guard, that means this guy is not going to be able to send any messages to the port, to the switch, to pretend to be a switch himself. Okay, PPDUs are the frames that are exchanged between switches during the election. So he's going to prevent that, right? But this port, but all this also has to be uh, a port fast port. Okay, so root guard is to make sure that this guy will never um, 
you know, this guy will always be the root port, and so is this. So never this guy, if he's a root god. That means PC will never be a root port. Okay, loop guard. So loop guard means that um, if they are if they are designated, you don't want to make these designated. If they are non-designated, if this is designated, designated, you know, prevent the ports from being non-designated or designated whenever they want to, right? So the blocking data, leave them blocking and let the STP take care of itself. Don't just have them switch to designate because I can go to not alternate ports and make them non-designated, uh, make them designated. When you open up all the ports and there's no alternate ports, then data will go into a loop and that can create a big, big headache. All right. It's a little uh, um, long, I think. But it's okay. So uh, please uh, send in all the notes that I asked you to send in. Um, maybe it's a little late now, but uh, it probably was a good idea to break this lecture because it was a little bit long every 20 minutes or so. I don't know. I don't even know how long it took, but it doesn't matter. You're at the end anyway. Submit your homework, and I'll see you in class, and we'll do our labs in there. All right, until then, I'll talk to you later. Well, it took 51 minutes. See you in class.